Hello, my name is Ellen Pallavi and I'm a member of Community Board 8. I'm also a resident of Roosevelt Island and I'm pleased to have with me today Judy Birdie, who is the president of the Roosevelt Island Historical Society. And we're going to talk about the history of Roosevelt Island and how the Roosevelt Island Historical Society keeps everybody honest. Thank you very much. First of all, Ellen, it's a pleasure to be here. And I know you've worked very hard with Community Board 8, and it's a pleasure to uh, do this pr production with you and tell you a little bit about our island history. As you know, our community started in the 1970s, but the earliest history of the island goes back to the Indians when the island was called Minnehanock. When the Dutch occupied New York, they named the island Varkens Island, which means Hog Island. When the British, uh, during the Revolution and after the Revolution, the island was owned by the Blackwell family. And there, of course, the, in honor of the, the family, they named the island Blackwell's Island. The city bought the island from the Blackwell family in the 1820s. After the, in the, and they used it for institutional purposes. Uh, why the city would want an island about three miles away from Manhattan and where the most of the population was in the 1820s was to put their undesirable residence there. So Blackwell's Island became notorious for the prison, the lunatic asylum, the uh, penitentiaries, the workhouse, and the hospitals for different diseases. By the 1920s, the reputation of the island was a little scarred by the infamous goings on at some of the uh, corrections facilities and the hospitals that were on the island at the time did not like being associated with the name Blackwell's Island. So the island was, name was changed to Welfare Island in 1921. In 1970s, early 1970s, when the state was redeveloping Roosevelt, that, at that time Welfare Island, it was decided that Welfare Island was not a chic name to use if they were going to sell new apartments and new homes on the island. And the island was renamed in honor of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And it has been Roosevelt Island since 1973. I came to the island in 1977. I love the island history. I find it fascinating. As I say, it's a contained history uh, because the island is 147 acres or two miles long and 800 feet wide, but there are hundreds of years of history on the island and it's, our history is layered into different phases and different cycles and different centuries and it is always a great uh, amount of fun to look into the different aspects of what has gone on on this island in the middle of the river. You have a wonderful website and it has as much information about Roosevelt <laughs> Island as I can imagine. It's well, a very good website, and I, I urge our viewers to look at the website and learn lots mm -hmm. more about the island. It's, um, it's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Hi, Judy, are you the, the <laughs> only president? Oh, no, no, no. The island, the Historical Society was started in about 1976, and I was not president until the early 1980s. It was started by a group of people who moved to the island, the first residents to live in the new apartment houses, and they discovered that we had six landmark buildings and a very interesting history, mainly because Reverend Oliver Chapin, one of the founders of the Historical Society, had lived on the island for 10 years before the community was built. He was a minister who was assigned to Kohler Hospital, and he just loved to dig into history. And I think I adopted his bug for history when I got to the island and started taking his walking tours. And the Historical Society started in 1976, and it has prospered all of these years. And it, uh, it's very important to us that people know about the history of the island and know that there's a historical society here and people that really care and make sure that uh, development and things that go around, especially around our landmark structures, are done properly. And that's one aspect of our historical society. We also run a lot of programs, tours, and events to highlight the island history. As, as president, what would you say you've accomplished? What is your most proud moment? Well, as president, uh, there are many things. I think my favorite 
<laughs> idea was to bring the visitor center trolley kiosk from Brooklyn to Roosevelt Island. Originally, there were five kiosks that served the trolley system, and they were located in Manhattan. You would get on a kiosk, go down the steps of the kiosk, and enter into a trolley station. The trolleys went over the Queensboro Bridge to different neighborhoods in Queens. One of the trolleys stopped over Blackwell's Island in those days. You would get off the trolley and take a large elevator onto the island. That was the, the only land way to access the island. This tro the trolley system was closed down in the 1950s, and the entrance kiosks were abandoned. We discovered in 2003 that one of the kiosks was available, and working through our city council person, uh, in those days it was Jessica Lappin, we got the funding and the kiosk was moved to Roosevelt Island and it became our visitor center. And we're very proud of it. It's located right at the tram station and we welcome over 35 to 40,000 visitors a year in, at the kiosk. That was, that was quite a find. <laughs> Thank it's a you. beautiful kiosk uh -huh. and you do a very nice job with that, uh -huh. with that visitor center. Can you tell us about that pole, the lamp? The lamppost base is another one of these New York stories. Uh, there were two lamppost bases. One of them was located at 59th Street at the entrance to the Queensboro Bridge, and that one is still there. The other lamp base was removed because the Roosevelt Island tram was being built over 60th Street, and the column from this lamp base would have been hit by the tram cabins. So the lamp base, the lamp was completely removed and put in storage. Of course, no one knew what happened to it for over 35 years. And lo and behold, I'm talking to a gentleman who's an expert in Queens history, Mitch Waxman, and we're chatting one day and he says, I think I know where that lamp base is. And there it was in a New York City Department of Transportation storage yard off Northern Boulevard in Woodside. And it took us three years, but we got the city of New York to give it to Roosevelt Island. And it is only the base because unfortunately the lamp, po the post and the bo uh, sh uh, sh chandeliers, the lights were gone. But this beautiful art, uh, uh, Bow Arts lamp base is now located next to the kiosk. Judy has a certain magic to make <laughs> these things happen. Yes. It takes a lot of grit. But I remember when it was, when, when there was a ribbon cutting for that. Right. So Judy, can you tell us about the internship program? Oh, uh, most summers we have an internship program and we have had students from Pratt uh, School of Historic Preservation, from Columbia School of Historic Preservation, and a student from Cornell University. He came to, with us twice to be an intern. And our interns do wonderful things. They help us set up art exhibits. They do re record keeping and archival work in uh, our office. We have a small office in the Octagon. And they also put a fresh face on our history because they look at things like an outsider. And sometimes that's really wonderful. And we really enjoy working with our interns. We're also going to have an intern this summer. And she's coming from another university and uh, she'll be here for about six or eight weeks in June and July. And we're really excited when we have young, fresh, historic preservation-minded students come and they all love working on the island. I bet, I bet. And when I was looking at the website right. to prepare for this mm -hmm. program, I noticed that you have the Blackwell's Albanac, right. which do you mail them out, or do well, you just have them on the website? They can be mailed out, but Blackwell's Almanac was started by one of our board members, and she has taken on the uh, job of writing three to four articles for a quarterly publication, and she does a lot of in-depth history, historical research, and the, the online uh, almanac, which is on our website, rihs.us, is absolutely fantastic and, and people just love the articles and some of the articles are long so they're serialized and they're usually about topics that people aren't 
that familiar with. One of our continuing stories was the tale of a family who lived on the island. The father was the keeper of the storehouse, and it's a story of a family who lived on the island in the early 20th century. And it's just fun to read about family life of someone who, of a family of seven children, all living on the island with their parents in a completely different time. And it really shows how these people worked. Most of the, the fathers worked for the different institutions, either the penitentiary or the hospitals. And the children lived on the island like ordinary kids, but they usually went off the island every day to go to school. And they depended on ferry boats and trolley cars to get to school. And uh, reading their stories and the different stories we put in the almanac really brings a different uh, perspective to the island history. I've, I've been to some of your programs, and I know you have the New York Public Library <laughs> program. <laughs> Can you tell us about what things you've been doing with that? Sure. Uh, for the last five or six years at least, we have been co-sponsoring programs with the New York Public Library four times a year, usually four consecutive months. And April will be our last program of this season. We find different speakers, mostly from off the island, to talk on diverse historical uh, subjects. We had uh, very, very good speakers so far this year. We had a gentleman who was uh, photographed historical suitcases that came from a state lunatic asylum, and they come with a long story. They're called the Willard Stu Suitcases, and they were from the asylum, the Willard State Asylum, and John Crispin did a beautiful presentation about the stories behind the suitcases, how they were preserved and the people they belonged to. We had an excellent program from uh, Liz McKay, who talked about a, a steamship that's being restored, the SS Columbia. And on April 12th, we're having a program uh, by Professor Jane Brickman, and she is doing a program on childbirth at the maternity hospital, at the city hospital on the island. And this is a completely new subject to us. We knew there was a maternity hospital, but we never knew much about it. So on April 12th, she will be uh, discussing it with us. And these programs are always diverse. There are always different uh, topics. Uh, every year we ch try to choose a theme, and we find that people really enjoy them. And we're very appreciative this year because Amalgamated Bank has become our co-sponsor, and it's made the programming uh, even better. Excellent. So you have a kiosk, right. which we talked about. Mm -hmm. And I know that you sell things yes. in the kiosk. What is there? What is the? What do you do with the kiosk? What do we do with sales? the kiosk? We uh, the kiosk is there for a multitude of purposes. Of course, it's called the visitor center, so we're more than happy to welcome every visitor that comes off the tram or walk, uh, walks up from the subway, and finds their way in the kiosk. We give them maps of the island, of the city. We tell them of different events going on. We tell them about uh, different sites to see. Many people do not know about the FDR Park. They do not know about Main Street. They do not know about the island uh, attractions. So our staff, we have a staff of about five people, and our workers are very proficient in island history and island activities, and we direct our visitors to see our sites. Also, we have a nice shop at the kiosk with very large selection of reasonably priced gifts, and uh, we try to have things that are thematically Roosevelt Island. We have Roosevelt Island pins, mugs, mouse pads, books. We have our history book there, which is a very popular seller, and we find that uh, it's a great place for our, our residents to come and pick up gifts and uh, to learn more about island history. People come in the kiosk and they don't realize that we're there and we are there to serve the community. We're there to publicize events. And uh, we're very proud of it. Plus the kiosk really has a connection to the island because originally you went into the kiosk, got on the trolley, went over the Queensboro Bridge and were left 
in the middle of the bridge over an island and took the elevator down. It's a little hard to explain uh, but just by discussing it. So, but the kiosk uh, has a, a long time history of the island. It was built in 1909. It is the only, the, probably the smallest Guastavino tile ceiling in New York. The kiosk is only 200 square feet and it has a beautiful dome ceiling and I suggest people come in next time they take the tram and look at our beautiful ceiling. Yeah. I'm glad you pointed that out because <laughs> you I've never, never knew, actually looked at the ceiling. You never knew we had a Guastavino <laughs> Well, it's a little hard to see from the, from the street unless you crook your neck. <laughs> Well, I've been in there, and I've never noticed. I've okay. never looked up. Right. Well, it's a next time reason to come see. in. Can you tell us about the coloring book project? Oh, the coloring book project is a fun project. There's a young lady who decor does the decorating in one of our storefronts with cartoon characters, and when we had our Fall for Arts Day, we asked her to do. Uh, simple drawings of our landmark structures and we enlarged the drawings and gave them to our local kids and asked them to color them in. Well they were so popular and such a success that we have put together a 15 page coloring book and of the island, not only the landmarks of different island things like the tram and the lighthouse and different sites and the kids will enjoy seeing it, and hopefully it will be out within the next month or two. And you're going to be selling these? We're going to be selling them at the visitor center, and Excellent. we're going to also be selling them through the school and the other programs. Nice. Tell us a little bit about your educational tours. Uh -huh. Well, every year we run tours, either public tours or private tours. Uh, we, we're going to be doing our annual cherry blossom tour on Saturday, April 23rd. We just want the cherry blossoms to cooperate. And it's a lovely walk for about an hour just down the, uh, the uh, promenade on the island, admiring the cherry trees and seeing the island in full spring bloom. We have over 400 uh, flowering trees on the island. So people really enjoy taking the cherry blossom walk. We also do educational tours for a lot of colleges, for a lot of architecture and planning programs. We have done uh, them for all different kinds of groups and we are glad to arrange tours for uh, senior groups, uh, kids groups, any kind of groups and we tailor them especially to the needs of the, uh, the group taking it. We can do a tour for one hour or we can do an all day tour. And many people are so surprised, they say, how can we spend all day on Roosevelt Island? But believe me, there are many, many things to see. And uh, people are very happy once they take our tours. So do you, on your tours, do you give an in-depth history of each of yes. the we do it, locations? Uh, we do an in-depth history or we, we focus on what the groups are interested in. There are some groups that are very much interested in the social history and other groups are interested in architecture. Whatever the groups are interested in, we're more than glad to accommodate them. And tell me about the advocacy that you do. Well, we advocate for the island for preservation, and we advocate with our politicians. We have very good relationships with our local politicians' offices. We also advocate on behalf of the uh, society with REAC, the Roosevelt Island Operating Corporation, uh, to make sure that our landmark structures and our island history is preserved and treated well. We uh, strongly believe that the, all the best intention should be followed when it comes to preservation and maintaining our community and uh, the structure that we were built under. We were built as a real community and that's very important that we not forget the, the community aspect and not just another place to live. This Roosevelt Island has a heart and we like, the society really likes to keep, keep the heart pounding. Great. I'd like to ask you about the, uh, the octagon, which is now the octagon, but used to be the New a York's. lunatic asylum. That's right. In the 1830s, New York City built the first municipal lunatic asylum and it was placed on Blackwell's Island. It opened in the late 1830s. It was expanded in the 1840s. 
and it was notorious, and it was definitely the word notorious because it did not have a good history. Uh, in 1843, Charles Dickens came to see the Lunatic Asylum, and he wrote about it in his book, American Notes. Luckily, it was only two or three pages, because he really thought the institution was horrible, and the patients were being maltreated, and it was very discouraging to read his account. In 1887, a young reporter for the New York World came to expose the uh, maltreatment at the Lunatic Asylum, and her name was Nellie Bly. She was a young cub reporter for the New York World, which was owned by Joseph Pulitzer. She feigned insanity by mumbling in foreign tongues in a room and staying in a rooming house. After a few days, the keeper of the rooming house thought that the woman was mad, and she was taken off to Bellevue Hospital, where she probably had a five-minute evaluation, and they discovered that she was crazy, and she was put on a steamer and sent off to Blackwell's Island. And she writes about being given a bath by having a bucket of ice water dumped on her, by horrible food, by treatment that was beyond comprehension. Unfortunately, the quote unquote nurses at the asylum were really female prisoners from the workhouse. Luckily, after 10 days, she was lucky because uh, the newspaper got her freed and she wrote an expose called 10 Days in the Madhouse which was serialized in the New York World newspaper for weeks on end, <laughs> as they did in those days. And it did lead to some improvements. And this was 1887. By 1895, the state had taken over uh, care of psychiatric patients, and it no longer was under the jurisdiction of the city. And the building closed as the Lunatic Asylum in 1895. And it then became Metropolitan Hospital, which was a general hospital, an acute care hospital. And they stayed in the same building until 1955. And in 1955, they relocated. The building was then abandoned for over 50 years. And in the late uh, 2000s, a developer came and redeveloped the building. Uh, the oct octagonal entrance was completely restored, being a landmark. It looks the way it did in 1895. Two new wings were added, and now it's an apartment house. And it's, it's called the Octagon. It's just beautiful. It is a beautiful. I, yes. I find it's my favorite building on the island. Well, my favorite building is the Smallpox Hospital. <laughs> okay. And, and you see it all the time when you right. walk into South Point Park. Right. The Smallpox Hospital was also built in the 1860s. Smallpox was such a contagious disease that even rich people had to go to the hospital. Unfortunately, the cure rate was very low, and uh, the hospital accommodations were very, very poor. The hos Luckily, vaccinations came into being in the 1870s, and the smallpox hospital was closed as a hospital, a contagious disease hospital, and it became the third school of nursing in the United States. The original building was designed by James Renwick, Jr., who was the architect of St. Patrick's Cathedral, amongst other buildings. And uh, in 18... Uh, the 1890s, when the building was converted to a school of nursing, two new wings were added to it, which complement the original building. And it was in use until 1950s as the school of nursing. Unfortunately, it was abandoned, and at this point it's just a stabilized ruin that is uh, visible from the FDR Drive at night when it is lit up. It's really very beautiful. Mm -hmm. There's another building that's very interesting behind it called the Strecker Labs, but right. I've never known what goes on in there <laughs> well, or what went on well, in there. Well, what went on in there was interesting. In the, at the turn of the century, the 1890s, Miss Strecker, the daughter of Mr. Strecker, I've yet to figure out exactly what her father did, donated the money for a medical research laboratory. It was a pathology research laboratory that was part of the city hospital which adjoined the site. And she uh, funded this building and it was used for pathology, path uh, pathological research, which means they did autopsies there and did research uh, there for many, many years. It, had, uh, a be it has a beautiful, uh, construction because it's brick and Fordham Nye is the native stone to the island. 
and it is uh, now been converted to a power conversion station for the New York City subway system. So you look at this beautiful building that's completely restored, and you don't realize that inside is power conversion equipment for the TA because the 53rd Street subway tunnel runs under the building. And uh, luckily, when the building was made into this power station, uh, it had to be restored as it looked in originally. The good thing about having these projects done in landmark buildings is that they are eventually restored to their original beauty. That's great. Real benefit from, from That's the true. landmark commission. <laughs> That's true. Can you tell us about, I've heard Mae West was somehow involved in Boss oh, yeah. Tweed? Oh, and we've had a few illustrious guests here. Mae West was in a show called Sex in 1927, and it was raided by the New York Police Department. The funny thing is, the mayor was out of town, and the deputy mayor decided that this show was corrupting our... <laughs> the morals of the city. So he had the show raided. Of course, the police decided they had to watch the entire show before they could close it. And she, poor Miss West was sentenced to 10 days in the women's workhouse on Blackwell's Island. And she came and she served her 10 days. She did complain that the uh, underwear was a little scratchy because they didn't let her wear her silk undergarments. But the warden of the penitentiary took her out for a ride every afternoon in his touring car. And she happily left the island after 10 days and never returned. That's an interesting story. We're not going to get a chance to get to Boss Tweed, but okay. Judy, this was so interesting. Thank so you. So interesting. Thank you very much. And I urge our viewers to go look at the website. Yes, the website has lots of really interesting information. R-I-H-S dot U-S. Excellent, excellent. So thank you very much, and thank you viewers for tuning in. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>